afternoon, everyone. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> All right. Happy Thursday. Let me just put this on silent. <laughs> Sorry? I mean, in 24 hours. Well, even less. <laughs> So I have I have a few notes uh, for you. Welcome to the noon briefing. And before I start, I actually want to uh, welcome this year this year's participant in the Shireen Abu Akleh training program for Palestinian broadcasters and journalists. I believe they are all sitting at the back of the room. Welcome to the noon briefing. And welcome to the UN. We're very happy that you're with us today and that you're participating in this program. Just a quick note on the program. It was established in 1995, and since then, 203 Palestinian journalists have benefited from the program. So welcome to New York. Welcome here today. Um, now, turning to uh, our boss, the Secretary General, he is on his way to Phnom Penh, Cambodia, where, as you know, he will address the ASEAN UN Summit, focusing on regional and global trends, the climate emergency, as well as the situation in Myanmar. And as you know, from there, he will push farther east, and he will travel to Bali in Indonesia to attend the annual Group of 20, the G20 Summit, where he will address sessions on food and energy energy, security, as well as on health. Now turning to Ukraine, uh, our colleagues on the ground are telling us that the UN, NGOs, and the entire humanitarian community continue to work to sustain aid operations and to reach people impacted by the war with life-saving support, with the life-saving support they need. Since February, aid workers have provided critical aid and protection services to some 13.5 million people across all regions of Ukraine, more than 4.2 million people have received cash assistance over the past eight months. Markets in Rio are reopening and the government is working on restoring banking services in areas of the Kharkiv and Kherson region where Ukraine recently regained control. Our partners are extending their cash programs also in these areas. We are also working to bolster health assistance as the war continues to decimate health services with hundreds of medical facilities damaged across the country. For for example, this month, the UN Population Fund is delivering 30 mobile clinics that will provide reproductive health services for women in at least 19 regions of Ukraine. Since the beginning of the war, we and our partners have provided health services to more than 8.6 million people. We continue to provide water and hygiene assistance, having reached 5.7 million people as communities face increasing difficulties in accessing clean water due to infrastructure damage. This scale-up of humanitarian assistance in Ukraine was only possible thanks to the support of our donors. They have provided more than 70% of the 4.3 billion requested for aid operations. However, as the war continues to drive humanitarian needs in the country, the international community's continued support is critical to ensure that aid organizations can continue supporting the people of Ukraine. And back here in New York, this morning at the Security Council, the Council held a high-level debate on the theme of counterterrorism in Africa, an imperative for peace, security, and development. Speaking on behalf of the Secretary General was, as you know, his deputy, Amina Mohamed. She said that nowhere has the threat of terrorism been felt more keenly than in Africa, pointing to Daesh, Al-Qaeda, and their affiliates having exploited instability and conflict across the continent. She said that their senseless, terror-fueled violence has killed and wounded thousands with many more, especially women and girls, continuing to suffer from the broader impact of terrorism on their lives and livelihoods. Ms. Mohamed stressed that in today's hyper-connected world, the spread of terrorism in Africa is not a concern for African member states alone. She called for, multi for effective multilateral responses, including addressing the 
climate emergency, armed conflict, poverty, lawless cyberspace, and the uneven recovery from COVID-19. And you, uh, we have shared these remarks with you earlier today. Now, staying in Africa. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, staying in Africa, the UN mission in Mali, MINUSMA, has issued its report on trends of violations and abuses of human rights and international humanitarian law, which covers the period from July to September of this year. During this period, the mission documented 375 violations and abuses of human rights and international humanitarian law, which represents a 20% decrease compared to the previous quarterly report. In total, 243 civilians were killed, 77 injured, and 55 were abducted of, or missing. 10% of them were women and 1% children, according to the data documented by the mission. Extremist groups continued to be the main perpetrators of violations. The UN mission welcomes the efforts made by the Malian authorities to combat impunity, including the announcement of the opening of investigations into allegations of violations attributed to the Malian Defense and Security Forces. The mission continues to actively support national efforts to to ensure greater respect for human rights and to end impunity, including through training and capacity building. Now, turning to Lebanon, the humanitarian coordinator there, Imran Riza, announced today $9.5 million in new funding to prevent the spread of cholera in the country. You will recall that a cholera outbreak was declared in Lebanon last month. The new funding from the UN Central Emergency Response Fund and the Lebanon Humanitarian Fund will focus on improving access to safe water, sanitation, and hygiene in areas at high risk of of the spread of cholera. The resources will help support water and wastewater systems, chlorinate household water tankers, and support cholera treatment center un uh, centers unit. More than 1.5 million people across Lebanon, including Lebanese people, Syrian refugees, Palestine refugees, and migrants who are at heightened risk of being exposed to cholera will benefit from this funding. I have a travel uh, announcement for you. The Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Relief Co Coordinator Joyce Msuya has kicked off an official visit to the Republic of Korea. She is currently in Seoul. Uh, the aim of her mission is to deepen cooperation on humanitarian issues and to hear from the government about the pressing issues on their agenda. While in the Republic of Korea, Ms. Msuya will meet with senior government officials and humanitarian NGO representatives. In Seoul, she will also meet with students at Korea University's College of International Studies, where she will speak about today's most pressing challenges and her hopes for young people to address them. And finally, a few uh, announcements. We have four new resident coordinators to announce today. The Development Coordination Office says that Ana Graça of Portugal and Laila Peters Yaya of Canada took up their posts as resident coordinators, respectively, in Panama uh, and Mauritania this past Monday. Also, uh, Liza Singh of Nepal will start her role in leading our team in Mauritius and Seychelles tomorrow, while Franci uh, Francisco Pichon of Colombia will take up his post on Saturday in Cuba. They were all appointed by the Secretary General and were confirmed by the respective host governments. As representatives of the Secretary General for Development at the country level, the resident coordinators, as you know, they lead UN teams' work on the ground to implement and also to rescue the sustainable development goals and to support authorities to tackle development emergency. The full biographies of all of them uh, are online. And that, it is, that is it for me. All right, James. Uh, G20 summit, which um, uh, the Secretary General will be attending. Mm -hmm. We understand that President Putin will not be attending. 
Uh, does um, the Secretary General believe that's a missed opportunity given the war in Ukraine? And also, with regard to the G20 summit, we now learn that President Biden uh, will be having a bilateral meeting with President Xi on Monday. Uh, does the Secretary General see opportunities in having the two major superpowers in the world, their leaders, meeting together? Mm -hmm. uh, and what is his views on what that could mean for Taiwan? Mm -hmm. um, I will not, not go into much details, but uh, of course, you know, any uh, meeting, any chance that world leaders have to engage in dialogue is good to help uh, advance and resolve tensions and issues around the world. Uh, and while he is there, uh, he is really hoping to engage as much as possible with leaders that will be attending. We have shared in the past his letter to the G20, so I think, you know, his objectives and what he's trying to achieve there is uh, is, is well known, and he's spoken uh, himself about it, so I think he spoke about it more eloquently than I could, uh, but he's really looking forward to, to engaging as much as possible with uh, all the leaders who will be there. Um, if I can just follow yeah. up with a specific question about the diplomacy on Ukraine. Yes. Uh, the U.S. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, mm -hmm. General Mark Milley, um, has been speaking um, 24 hours ago in New York. Um, he said that uh, the winter lull will be coming because of the because of the climate, um, and even though the U.S. is a very strong supporter in this war of the Ukrainian side, mm -hmm. he said it was time to seize the moment for peace talks. Does the Secretary General believe the time is right now, and does he share that message? I think the Secretary General, uh, well, he's expressed himself in the past quite a few times on his hopes for Ukraine and Russia to uh, to engage in discussions uh, on peace talks. I think that, you know, if there's a window of opportunity, uh, let's seize it. Uh, Edie. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, a quick follow-up on the G20. Mm -hmm. Does the Secretary General have any plans to meet Xi Jinping, who did not go to COP27? Um, we will share more details as uh, bilaterals are, uh, the plans are firmed up. Uh, I think we will have more details in the coming days as these things shape up. And on ASEAN, um, mm -hmm. are we going to be getting um, any update on the Secretary General's goals for um, ASEAN, including um, any um, comments or action he's going to call for on Myanmar. Uh, yes. Let me check also with uh, with the team. They are on their way right now to Cambodia. Um, as soon as we hear, you know, yesterday I mentioned that uh, that we would try to, to share an embargoed copy of the remarks that he will deliver. I'll check with the team uh, when and if this is this is possible. And then tomorrow, as he arrives there, we will have a, a, a more uh, a, a bigger update on on what is going on there. Okay. Yes. And my question was, uh, the Taliban has banned women mm -hmm. from going into parks. Yeah another major restriction on their movements. Does the Secretary General have any comment? I think, as we've stated many times in the past, uh, as regards to, to women's freedom, uh, w we believe that it's important to respect the liberty and to respect the r human rights of women uh, everywhere around the world, in Afghanistan also especially. Um, uh, yes, Pam. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, my question is a follow-up on these two on the G20. Mm -hmm. uh, does the Secretary General, even though we haven't seen his speech or he hasn't delivered it, have a message or on priorities for the G20? And on Xi Jinping and a meeting, is there any expectation that in addition to that, he would meet with Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov or so anyone else. <laughs> and can you share it uh, as soon as you know it? Thank you. We will do all of that. Uh, you know, on his expectations and priorities, I let me just refer you back to the letter that he sent to the G20. I think everything is in there. And on his activities and on his meetings, we will keep you up to date uh, as it happens. Uh, but we'll 
Thank you, Stephanie. I was going to ask about Afghanistan as well. I'll mm -hmm. follow up on Edie's question. The UN General Assembly is discussing the situation in Afghanistan right now. And given the statements we have heard from the member states, uh, the situation in the country under the Taliban has further deteriorated. And the latest news, uh, just as Edie said, uh, the Taliban mm -hmm. authorities have banned women from visiting all parks in Kabul. And I was also told uh, that they may expand uh, their school ban to universities for women. Is the UN aware of this? And on um, the ban, uh, women can't go to the parks anymore. Uh, UNAMA or any UN officials, have you contacted the Taliban? Uh, let me check on that. And you know, given your question, I think it could be also a good time for us to request uh, a humanitarian update on Afghanistan. It's been a few days, right, since we had one. So let me ask the team on the ground and let me follow up on, on these questions with the teams and on, on the possible engagement that they've had uh, on the ground directly with the authorities. Um, Celia, and then... I'd like to ask about the freedom of the press, which seems to be really in danger all over the world. Uh, two days ago, a French journalist working for uh, Reuters was mm -hmm. expelled from the yeah. DRC, just like that, mm -hmm. in five minutes. No reason was given for her expulsion. So is the Secretary General really worried about the freedom of the press right now because it seems to be, I mean, difficult for mm -hmm. journalists to do their work. Um, on freedom of the press, I think the Secretary General has expressed himself uh, quite clearly, clearly on the importance of press freedom. I think we had the day of press freedom a few, a few a week yeah, or two ago. Yeah, I see that. Yes. She uh, was expelled. Yes. So, I mean, come on. Yes, yes. <laughs> It's, uh, um, I, can, I can only reiterate, you know, our general principle that applies to all countries around the world where we uh, strongly believe that freedom of the press is very important. Uh, uh, Evelyn. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, to follow up on Celia, uh -huh. I've, I've, the Security Council has never passed any kind of resolution on freedom of the press. Do you know if anyone's pressing them to do so or... The SG uh, asking them, or because it's the, it's an issue that they've ignored. And secondly, well, I have another question. Mm -hmm. If you'll answer that, um, on uh, Kerasin in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any update? Is there any um, uh, how how is the access for the UN, and what are they doing there? Mm -hmm. So let me start and the with, fighting. Right. Yeah, so let me start uh, with Ukraine in uh, Kherson. Uh, you know, our colleagues are, th they're monitoring the situation on the ground. Uh, and as I said yesterday, uh, if we're, we're monitoring w what is going on, how it's evolving, and our humanitarian colleagues remain ready uh, to begin delivering assistance when security guarantees are made so that they can have access to, to people in need. Uh, but of course, you know, right now it's, it's monitoring mode to see what is going on and how the situation is evolving. Um, yes, Desi. I have a follow-up on yeah. the... Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to answer uh, your, your first... Uh, your first question, um, remind Freedom me. of the press. Yeah. The Security, the Security Council. Council, yes, yes, on this. <laughs> Sorry about that, Evelyn. He has the mic. <laughs> Maybe he can answer. <laughs> no, no, the, I, I remember now. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll refer you to, 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 uh, to member states on, on this. Uh, and Desi, go ahead. Yeah, I have the follow-up uh, on the withdrawal of Russian troops from Kherson. Mm -hmm. Since you said the UN team is monitoring the situation there, can the United Nations confirm that Russians started to withdraw from the, the city or, or not? I did not get at that information from my colleagues today, so I will leave it at that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You have, you have anything to add? Nothing. All right. Okay. So my second question is also concerning Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, today, the the General Assembly had the meeting to discuss the situation in Afghanistan, and during the speech of the PGA, uh, Ms. Croce said that uh, they they need four four point four billion U.S. dollars for emergency pledging, but now it's like 
2.3 billion in short. Given the fact that there are still 7 billion US dollars has been kept frozen by the United States, will the United, United Nations again to urge the US to release the, those those assets which actually belong to Afghanistan. Yes, on this, you know, I think it just reminds me that we're going to get a humanitarian update for you. And on the funds issues, I'll, I'll get back. I'll get back to you on the status. It's been a while since. Are you we, going to urge the U.S. Yeah. or mm -hmm. not? At this point, I'll, I'll get back to you on this. Okay. Yeah, uh, Linda. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you spoke earlier about the UN's. Um, humanitarian efforts in helping Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. My question is, I hope I didn't miss this, mm -hmm. but I was wondering if you have details about UN efforts or, or uh, ability to reach out to civilians in Russian-controlled areas or mm -hmm. in areas where Russia has vacated. So as you know, and we had a little bit uh, in today's update detailing how we're starting to we're scaling up the assistance in areas where, uh, where where we can have access, in areas where Ukrainians have regained control. Um, I'll refer you back to, to uh, for example, when Denise Brown was here a few a few days ago, she was talking about the difficulty and the impossibility in some cases of accessing, uh, of going across uh, across uh, the front lines, um, and so it, it's really. You know, we try to provide really updates every day on how we're able to to gain more access in areas that have been uh, that become now accessible. So I think that's where we stand on this. Let me just go to the back before I come back to you, James. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, my name is Veronika Molkozorova. I'm uh, from Ukraine, New Voice of Ukraine, and also Doug Hammerskjold fellow here. Yes. Uh, I want to ask you about Mykolaiv Oblast, which is also uh, south, south of Ukraine. Recently, uh, Ukrainian soldiers liberated the whole region, Mykolaiv Oblast, uh, including Kiselivka, which is uh, a village very important for the uh, running water uh, um, flow to Mykolaiv. So Mykolaiv will f finally get soon running water back again. And I was wondering whether the United Nations uh, is involved in uh, restoration of the running water in uh, the region and whether you have any details. Thank you. I don't have these specific details, but um, I'm taking note. I will ask. I will ask my colleagues on the ground who could uh, answer your specific question. Uh, sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm also from Ukraine, Vladimir mm -hmm. National News Agency of Ukraine, Ukraine Forum. Returning to the Russian crisis, uh, before Russia closed its borders to men, a million of Russians fled their country uh, to neighboring countries such as uh, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Mongolia, etc., hiding from mobilization. That is war. Uh, what is the status of these people uh, from the UN uh, point of view? Are they considered refugees or just uh, tourists? And people who fled where, sorry? Uh, from Russia. They oh, fled. I see, I see. Yeah. From mobilization. Uh, l let me get back to you on that, I will ask you. Uh, James. So I have a couple of follow-ups. Yeah. and want to sort of just, just pin, that, pin you down on a couple of things that you said earlier on and just be absolutely clear. On Linda's question, mm -hmm. whenever we get a statement from the podium, from yourself or from mm -hmm. Stefan or Farhan on the humanitarian situation mm -hmm. in the, in the um, Russian-occupied areas, you're nowhere near as clear-cut as De Denise Brown was. She said, we have had no access yeah. whatsoever to Russian areas. Can you be clear? Has that changed? Do you now have any access to Russian areas or is it still as clear-cut as she said, they're not letting you in at all? Let me, you know, I don't want to give you something that would not be fully accurate. Uh, I believe that Denise Brown was right in what she said to you. Well, I'm uh, sure she was right at the time, but yeah. that was two weeks ago. So. Exactly. So let, let me let me check because I think these are important questions and we need to give you the, the and right. And it would be useful yes. in, if your statements were yeah. more, because she was wonderfully clear cut. She was. was really clear. Yeah. Your statements aren't. You fudge it each time. So <laughs> could you be clear cut? If suddenly there is access that the Russians are letting you have access, we'd love to report on it, and it would be big news. But it's not clear from your statements whether there is access. So if the statements could be written in a more clear-cut way, 
so we don't have to keep pressing you on, on, on these issues. Um, and then I'm sorry, I'm going to press you again on one other, mm -hmm. um, which is um, uh, Edi and Betul, um, the situation in Afghanistan. You referred back to previous statements, but it's not a, something quite significant has happened here. They may be extending the education ban to higher education. Yeah. They are banning women from parks. They are banning women, I'm told, also from gyms. So women who have very, very little access anywhere, uh, having even more um, severe restrictions, we're moving to a situation where half the population of Afghanistan are effectively going to be under house arrest. What is the Secretary General's statement on this new reality, which is much mm -hmm. worse than yesterday? It is that the human rights of women need to be fully respected. And I will get you more details. Uh, yes. And what I can, you see, I'm, I have kind colleagues who are, uh, who are uh, giving me a bit more details on Ukraine. And it's, it's well noted, and I, I well noted. Uh, we still haven't had access to Russian-held areas that I can confirm. And I think in the notes, as we say every day, we always try to provide details on the assistance that is provided in newly regained areas, how we're expanding. But it's really well noted, and we'll make sure that it's clear. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Vitul. Uh, thanks, Stefani. Uh, on the announcement you had about this upcoming meeting in Geneva between mm -hmm. Martin Griffiths and the Russian officials, I'm not sure if you mentioned who the Russian officials were, and is it going to be only Russia and the UN, or will you have a third party? As you remember, Turkey was one of the facilitators. Uh, are they going to uh, join these meetings? I will tell you. Hold on. Um, so the, on the Russian side, it's going to be the deputy, uh, let me just, there's too many answers in that book here. <laughs> All right, so on the Russian side, um, so the, de the Russian delegation will be led by the deputy uh, minister of foreign affairs, Sergei Vershinin. Um, on our side, it will be uh, the delegation, as I said yesterday, Rebecca Grinspan, and it will be Martin Griffiths. Uh, one detail that I can also add is that in addition, um, in addition to to continuing the consultations and support of the efforts uh, by the SG on the full implementation of the two agreements signed in July. Uh, it is hoped that the discussions that will take place tomorrow will also advance progress made in facilitating the unimpeded export of food and fertilizers originating from the Russian Federation to the global market. So this is really uh, what is going on tomorrow. Uh, and it is, of course, you know, one, uh, one event that is part of the larger negotiations on these issues. Yes, James. Um, sorry, just to d double check on that. Mm -hmm. This is only a bilateral UN-Russian, because there are other parties to that agreement. Yeah. There's Turkey, Turkey, mm -hmm. sorry, and uh, yeah. there, is, um, there is Ukraine. There is no representative. This is just simply the discussion so, with, with, Ru with the Russian Federation. So tomorrow, that is, that is what we have. But again, as I said, this is part of the larger and overall negotiations that are taking place and that are ongoing. Um, will, um, uh, will one of the two UN um, uh, negotiators, um, Rebecca Greenspan or Martin Griffiths, be briefing the press either in Geneva or you know, our colleagues in Geneva or video link to us mm -hmm. because it's a very important issue. Uh, one would hope that one of them at least is doing a stakeout. So for tomorrow, not immediately after, but we will have, we will share information and I think we will put in a request uh, uh, to make sure that they provide an update uh, as soon as possible after that they come and talk to you when it's possible. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I think, uh, don't go away, Polina is here. <laughs> I have a question. Please, Stephanie. Oh. Stephanie? There's some questions I'm... online here. Oh, there are questions yes, there online. there are questions online. Yeah. Um, this is Joseph Klein. Hello? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, I didn't see you, yeah. Sorry, I didn't um, see that I'm... there were questions online. Yeah, I know you didn't comment. Uh, you have commented before on the open letter from High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Volker Turk, uh, to Elon Musk, um, urging him to uh, 
make sure that human rights are central to the management of Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering uh, two things here. I'm wondering, number one, uh, why such concerns haven't been expressed earlier to, titter, to Twitter's management uh, that had been accused of uh, fairly widespread censorship of free speech, um, particularly by, from conservative circles, uh, the suppression of the story on Hunter Biden's laptop, et cetera. So wh why, why suddenly now uh, is the UN Human Rights Office uh, taking a special interest in Twitter? And secondly, has anyone at uh, Mr. Turk's level or, or higher at the UN expressed similar concerns uh, to uh, TikTok, for example? Thank you. So our colleagues are in touch with uh, social media organizations, and I think there's been ongoing exchanges in the past. I would like to flag, because also James asked yesterday about uh, about our position on Twitter and how it's evolving. I would like to flag, and I probably should have flagged that earlier this morning, Melissa Fleming, uh, our USG for Communications, uh, published... Um, published a piece uh, titled Why the United Nations is Needed on Twitter. It's on Medium. Uh, you can also find it by looking at her Twitter account. So I, I will refer you to her piece on that, which provides uh, more on, on, how, on our position on how we see things moving forward uh, from this point. Yeah, yeah, but, but that doesn't answer the question uh, in terms of looking back. Why those kinds of concerns expressed in Mr. Turk's open letter to Elon Musk regarding Twitter currently were not expressed months, months ago or even years ago when Twitter was accused of widespread censorship. And also, I, I'm wondering whether similar concerns have been conveyed to uh, TikTok. I, th I think I've answered that. Uh... No, no, you didn't. Uh, yes, our call, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I, I'm trying There's to. I mean, now I'm trying to pin you down a little bit. <laughs> So, no, no, I, th what, what I said is that uh, contacts with social media organizations, uh, I've been ongoing between the UN and, the, and social media organizations uh, for months, for years. Um, but this open letter got a lot of prominence, so I'm trying to find it, out it whether did, anything yes, It did, yes. Yes. Sent in writing but I will, I will leave it, I will leave it at that. Okay, thank All you. All right. Was there was there somebody else online? I think I saw Abdel Hamid. No. Thank Other? you, Stephanie. Uh, I have I have first a footnote and, and a question. The footnote is that it is not fair to keep those who are in line and you take a second round of a question. I will tell that also to Stefan and to Farhan. I mean, take the first round from the room and then go to the show, to the online and then go back for a second round in the room. That is my footnote. My question now about uh, Thor Winslet. The man is absent from what's going on in the occupied Palestinian territory. The last time he spoke was on 16th of October. Everything happening, 690 Palestinians were arrested in October. Today, there is a young man killed in Jenin. Yesterday, in Balafa, there is another man killed. Today, they attacked a funeral in Beit Omar near Hebron. 118 settlers uh, stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque this morning, and 120 olive trees were cut off today. He is nowhere to be found. Only he spoke on the 16th of October when he went to Jenin and Nablus because he said the security situation is deteriorating, as if it stopped there. What's going on in the occupied territories, it's really a real war. The Israelis are waging a genocidal war against the Palestinians. And also, I ask you if there is a, uh, any comment on the, uh, uh, out, uh, the results of the Israeli elections. The extreme right now in power, almost 14 members of the uh, seat will go to the most extremist in the history of Israel. And I ask you if there is any comment, and normally they do comment on elections. Why there is no comment on the Israel outcome of the Israeli elections? Um, 
Um, I believe that uh, Mr. Venesland was at the Security Council just a few days ago. And uh, on the other question, as I said, you know, uh, we're checking on this. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the detailed answer. Thank you.